All right. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to start out by uh, thanking you all for joining me this afternoon. And uh, thank you for uh, Finos for inviting us to, uh, to talk. Um, if you were just here for Ibrahim's presentation, uh, he told me that he had planned on 45 minutes. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking in my head, if he uh, delivered the pie, I'm going to I'm going to deliver one small slice. Um, when we put the presentation together, we were thinking about, you know, the things that have happened. Um, Equifax comes to mind, where they found themselves in a situation where they were in the headlines and they really wish that they hadn't been. And so it's really about understanding, managing the risks around open source. But I think more importantly, it's about understanding how the poor management of open source uh, leads to not only not being able to manage those risks, but also it comes with, it, with its own set of consequences. Uh, again, Ibrahim, the gentleman who just spoke, he had all of these uh, 17 different ways that you can be involved in changing your culture and, and managing open source. And he gave that great example of, you know, there was a Word document for every piece of open source uh, that his development teams wanted to use, and it required five approvals. And that's just crazy. If you put in poor programs, poor open source management, uh, then you slow down and you start to lose the benefits of, of open source software. So, um, you know, I think if you came to any of the opening sessions today, you probably heard uh, most, if not all, of this. Um, and Ibrahim, I keep referring to him, but everything he said in his presentation is really applicable to what I'm talking about. You know, the financial industry, FinTech, is really um, the new kid on the block, but there's a real rise and a real kind of understanding now of the role of open source in, in developing solutions. Um, and uh, we heard some of the keynotes this morning talk about how digital transformation is so, so important going from you know, uh, solutions that were hosted in-house to cloud. Um, this is a couple of real interesting statistics too that make the management of open source more important than ever before. And it's, it's the idea that what we're seeing is a rise in financial firms uh, being hit with cyber attacks. And so th there's a couple of pretty interesting statistics here in terms of how the financial industry seems to see a real growth in cyber attacks. And so security, especially as they're implementing more open source software, is more important than ever before. So uh, hopefully the reason you're here is because you understand the advantages of open source software. But I always like to start here because I, I, I work for a, a software vendor that provides solutions. So, so uh, you know, part of the reason I'm here is I want to sell you something, right? I want to I sell you uh, some tools that will help you with managing your open source software. And a lot of the times the approach that um, we as salespeople take is we come out and we try to scare you. You, you, know, you. you know the term FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But the concept is, oh my gosh, open source is great, but it's, you know, it's, it's really, uh, there's all these horrible risks that are associated with it. And if you don't manage open source, you know, you're, you know, you're opening yourself to all of these risks. And while that's true, I think we can't lose sight of the fact that those risks are, are minimal uh, you know, when we look at, at all the advantages of open source. So obviously, I think the first thing that drew a lot of people to open source was <laughs> there's, no, there's no license fees, right? So there's some cost effectiveness to it, especially now where we see open source providing, uh, you know, frameworks and, and application uh, development platforms that provide tons of functionality that in the past were only provided by proprietary uh, vendors at high licensing costs. Uh, faster time to market, obviously, if you can focus on your, on your business logic, right? The things that allow you to uh, innovate in the market, right? Open source can give you a leg up. Reliability, uh, from the beginning of open source, Bruce Perrin said, you know, it was really about a lot of eyeballs, that we could fix problems very quickly. And there's a lot of evidence today that suggests that open source especially in the more mature communities, uh, is actually more reliable than uh, commercial software. And then finally, community. And, and I hate to say this, but I wish I had known this <laughs> prior to coming today. The, uh, you know, when I got here and I started listening to people talk, they really, they, they're talking more and more about the role of community and contribution when you use open source. And I, I spoke with Jim Jagalski, who used to be the president of the Apache Software Foundation, about an hour ago, we, we kind of talked about this. 
and he believes that the sense of community is, is key and contribution is important, but it's not uh, absolutely integral to you know, providing solutions, but it is important. So the question I have is, you know, is your software composition analysis non-existent? And so this requires <laughs> a little bit of explanation. So software composition analysis, first of all, let me explain that term. I've been working in the, the open source uh, industry for about 15 years now. And during that, when we first started, we talked about open source governance. We talked about open source scanning, right? And now the, the analysts, the market analysts have now kind of categorized this into something called software composition analysis. And there's a term emerging called SBOM or software bill of materials, where the idea is you have your proprietary code, but you have third party components and open source. And so managing these third party components is absolutely essential to the success of your program. So when we talk about open source in particular, we always talk about three key risks, right? There's the legal side of things, there's license compliance, which ultimately leads to a second risk, which I call copyright infringement. When you don't comply with an open source license, that license ceases to exist, it terminates. When it terminates, you have someone else's code in your product, right? And they're protected under copyright law, so it becomes copyright infringement. And that, that is a huge risk that you have to manage. And obviously, getting hacked um, and, and security. So, but, but why do you need SCA? I mean, I laid out some risks, right? And you know, I talked about all these advantages and everything. But, but why is software composition analysis so important? So let's, let's kind of take a, take a look at this. So I, I think the thing that we need to talk about is not so much the risks, but rather the consequences of what happens if you don't manage the open source that comes into your organization, right? So the first thing we like to say in the industry is you can't manage what you don't know. Open source is so easily available, so easily consumable to your, to your engineers, right? that even best practices where you shut down allowing people to use open source, they're still gonna use it, right? When you acquire third party commercial components because everybody's using open source, in your supply chain, you will get open source in your products. If you don't know what those components are, um, how can you possibly manage them, right? And uh, what Ibrahim said, again, <laughs> just, you know, if you have to send out a document every time you go to use a piece of open source and get five approvals and 100 uh, approvals are going to, requests are going to your legal department every day, uh, we worked with a major insurance company that we created a request approval process. At the beginning of it, they were doing um, 12 to 1,500 um, requests for open source uh, on a monthly basis when they first kind of opened the floodgates. And so these processes are absolutely essential uh, for making sure that you don't slow down your, your development cycles. It's the antithesis of why your team brought open source in. And one of my favorite stories was uh, going on a sales call one time, and we, we had some enterprise architects for, uh, this was for a large insurance company, and they said, we have an internal policy that prohibits the use of open source software. And, he goes, and they said to a man, we all use open source software, right? And so they were telling us, you know, we have this policy, but we know we use it, right? And so it became, you know, there was a dichotomy here. One, they had to convince the organization why it was so valuable, why they had to use it. And then uh, they had to sort of hide it in certain places to make sure that it didn't uh, have consequences for them based on the company's policies. And this all leads to losing the key advantages. So we, we list all these key advantages of open source, but not managing it can start to really negate those. And it can open you, you know, to these key risks that I listed on the previous page. And finally, <laughs> right, it's really about, um, you know, not becoming tomorrow's headline. So, Ibrahim like did, like did this 17 point thing and it was very detailed. And <laughs> I love that one chart he put, the eye chart that he put up where he, that was like, you know, 12 different areas and like 20 things underneath it about all the things you can do in all the different areas. And so I'm gonna just provide a very, really 60,000 foot level of what I think is really key and what I've seen companies do that have allowed them to be successful. And this is really, if you're in the infancy of your open source program and you're trying to figure out what do we do and how do we get there, 
The first thing is to really understand and prioritize risk. So with our two key areas of legal and security, what does it really mean for your organization, right? And it, and it really becomes important that if you don't have the expertise within your organization, right, that understands license compliance issues, that you work with uh, legal firms that do, for example, uh, you work with your security teams to understand, you know, where you have exposure if you use open source. The second thing is to establish tolerance levels. Um, I worked with a bank about 12 years ago that they had an open source policy that was about 175 pages. Over the next five years, they got that down to about 20 pages. And it was really interesting watching uh, the evolution of that document because what they did, what that 175 page document started out as was a definition of risk across the financial organization. So they said, here's where in each of the areas of the bank in application development where we see risk from security and legal and what the impact is on our organization. So once you understand your risks and you prioritize them, the thing that's important is to understand where you believe you have the greatest risk and where you have the least risk. And the reason this is important is the point that, again, Ibrahim made, made in his pre previous presentation, you can't cover everything all the time. You can't know every single piece of open source and every single piece of code that you develop. So prioritizing where you have the greatest risk is where you can focus your efforts. And with that, you can start to develop policies about different areas of product development and product delivery. And so um, one of the things that, that we see, for example, from a license compliance perspective, uh, products that are delivered, products that are delivered to a computer, an on-prem solution, delivered to a mobile device, to an IoT device, et cetera, those are distributed. Most open source licenses trigger on distribution. And so that gives you a much greater legal exposure in those types of applications. In hosted and cloud applications, right, there's only a few licenses today um, that really uh, discuss the use of open source technology in the cloud or in a network, right? And so the risk from a license compliance perspective is much lower. So in terms of the type of analysis you do and the type of management that you do uh, changes. And so you can start to develop policies around this. All right, so enabling your team with the right tools is, is, is critical. Um, and again, I just have three really high level points to think about here. I believe that education is probably the, the greatest tool you have today. One of the things that's, that's interesting watching open source over the last 15 years, uh, I was interviewing a candidate to help our organization with doing open source auditing. And I asked, you know, how much open source do you use? And I said, have you read any open source licenses? And the guy looked at me and goes, why would I read a license? It's free, right? And I mean, that's a, it's an interesting point of view, but maybe a lot of developers have that. So I think you can't assume within your organization that they understand the role that they play in managing the risks or the liabilities that using open source exists for your organization. And so educating them on your policies, right? Educating them on why the policies are important how using open source can get the company in trouble, right? Then they can start uh, to take, you know, uh, ownership in uh, managing those risks. Um, automation is absolutely key, and especially in large scale. You, you can't have a process, you know, where, uh, you know, you're sending hundreds of, of uh, requests. You need... Uh, automatic uh, approval processes, you need tooling for this type of thing, you need discovery. Um, the legacy of open source scanning really came out of tools that produced a lot of evidence and it required a lot of manual interaction to really determine what open source you had. Today, tools are getting much better and we're moving left in the development cycle to start to really um, collect and build your bill of materials in a much more automated fashion. So this is where software composition analysis, open source scanning is important. And it's important that when you select a tool, you select a tool when th that'll give you, you know, a high level of automation. And then finally, uh, ongoing monitoring. And uh, so one of the things I think that's, that's missed a lot of, a lot of times in developing policies is 
we, we think a lot of times about building bill of materials as a snapshot in time, right? That, um, you know, what's going on today? Do we have a license compliance issue today? Do we have security vulnerabilities in the code today? Well, th that's a sliding scale. R Redis, uh, MongoDB, um, a number of open source communities have changed their licensing over time. And so from a compliance perspective, to assume that when you have a bill of materials and a set of licenses and compliance steps that you've taken to make sure you're in compliance with that, that can change over time. So it's important that the tool is both used in a way that it incrementally monitors your code as it's being developed, as new open source is introduced, but more importantly, it's monitoring the communities as new security alerts, as new uh, as there's license changes, et cetera, happen. And so the, the, the tools can actually tell you uh, that changes are happening and you can uh, uh, move accordingly. So uh, earlier, uh, Finos and White Source got up and uh, I saw them put this slide up. <laughs> and I was watching, I was going, great, you know, this is, we're all talking about the same stuff. Uh, we did, uh, my company, Flexera, did a webinar just a week ago with Forrester. And uh, we had a senior analyst that really took, takes a look at how developers use open source. And what she said is that one, developers are always constantly looking at ways to develop faster and get to market quicker. And they're looking at ways to consume open source faster. And so this concept of moving left in the development cycle, I think everybody has talked about it today. But the question really becomes, you know, when and where do you take, you know, scanning tool, software composition analysis and insert it into your process? And I've seen you know, a number of organizations that, that are now using tooling around GitHub and repositories and build tools that as open source is being vetted, as it's being considered for use in the product during the design process, they're looking at it from a license and uh, security vulnerability perspective. And so SEA can help you in that part of the process, definitely. And obviously, you know, integrating it into your CI CD so that it's, it's constantly scanning on an incremental basis this is the way we've kind of used it traditionally over the years, and this is probably where its greatest strength is. For many organizations, there's still an issue of legacy code, right, after it's deployed. So there's code bases that maybe you don't have your bill of materials today, and so it's important that you uh, continue to scan through that code over time. And then not so much on the build cycle, but in really kind of the consumption and adoption level, this, this is really fascinating to me. When I first got in the business, you know, we would talk to people who are doing technology acquisitions and we'd ask them about doing, you know, open source compliance scanning and security scanning of the products that they were buying. And they go, well, that's expensive. Why would we do that, <laughs> you know? And over time, we see now that with M&A, it's, it's become uh, kind of a de facto standard that has become part of the due diligence process. If your organization's not currently doing that, it's, it's essential that you, that you incorporate that. And there's a real, in, there's a fundamental, I think it's a human nature concept, that we have a tendency to trust ourselves but not trust other people. And in relation to what I'm talking about, what I mean is this, is that if my engineering has a bunch of legacy code, right, I'm a lot less concerned about, you know, did they create some type of compliance and security issue even though all those risks are there. But if I'm buying somebody else's code, I got no idea what they've done, what their practices are, et cetera. And so it's, it's absolutely essential that we, that we do uh, scanning and we, and we do uh, software composition analysis um, as we bring code in through acquisition. And so um, just wanted to do a quick case study. Um, uh, we're working with a company in uh, Europe called Interneuron. They're a uh, health, healthcare industry. I wish I had a financial industry example. But this is really interesting. They, they were starting to take on a model where they wanted to develop products that weren't only proprietary in nature, but they wanted to provide uh, services and products in, in an open way uh, via open source. And one of the challenges they had was, you know, how do we get people to adopt our products when they can buy a competitor and they can go work with a commercial vendor, right? Um, how do we enable uh, transparency of open source use so they know everything we're using and assure them that it's safe? How do we decrease the knowledge gap around measuring open source quality? And um, the solution was to, was to use a software composition analysis tool. Now, my company, Flexera, has a tool called FlexNet Code Insight. That's what this company used. Um, there's a, some other companies here today, FASA and, and uh, WhiteSource, that provide 
similar types of solutions. So their whole idea was to build an infrastructure that was, that was going to allow them uh, to build uh, discovery, build their uh, software bill of materials, and to have uh, governance tooling in place. The second thing is really interesting. Now I've talked about kind of some steps that, that you can take to manage open source from a high level, prioritize risks, right? Understand where you have the greatest exposure, develop policies, educate, all of these types of things. And Interneuron realized they did not have the level of expertise within their organization, but they wanted to go to market quickly. So they actually went to a managed service model where they went to a company called Source Code Control. Again, this is in, in Europe. And uh, that had a lot of special, uh, specialization on governance and how to set up policies, et cetera. And they really focused on supply chain conformance. And so they realized that their tools both had tools coming into it and um, were going into other tools uh, that were going to be part of a su supply chain. So they used something from the Linux Foundation called OpenChain as a standard to provide supply chain conformance. Um, I'm going to skip the benefits for now. I just realized I have limited time. So the CTO made this comment. Every application we develop and deliver on today uses open source software. Together with FlexNet code inside and source code control, we're confident that our solutions are both vulnerability free and license compliant. Our customers trust us to deliver that 100% of the time. So this was, um, this was really the whole purpose of putting a program in place and, and developing the expertise to be able to, to, to make this commitment to their customers. And it provided significant business units, or business benefits, right? Um, so it removed the risk from purchasing decisions by showing to your customers that you have comprehensive programs in place for vulnerability checking and a, and a complete bill of materials is key. Um, by doing all of the vetting of the open source components as part of their process, right? They have a quality, consistent open source compliance and risk management. One of the key benefits they saw was new key business, or it was a new business opportunity. So previously, remember their challenge was proving to people that open source was every, from them was every bit as good as commercial uh, or proprietary software. Once they were, had the program in place and they had the proof points, then they, they were able to find new prospects and build trust with new organizations. So, so it created new opportunities for them. And it just, it overall improved their accountability and security, not just in the products that they sold, but, but within their own internal systems, and higher quality code and more yeah. uh, robust systems, yeah. our solutions. So I just, I wanted to keep this short. I realized I only had 25 minutes and just want to see if anybody has any questions at the end. So this is really about, you know, at a very, very high level, kind of understanding the steps that you can take as an organization to start to uh, really combat the idea of, you know, am I going to wake up tomorrow and have to write a press release that says, because we weren't managing open source, uh, you know, we have a security problem or we have a compliance issue. Um, just some key takeaways. So I mentioned I, I spoke with Forrester. Developer teams continue to move faster and view open source as, as a, a top priority to enable speed to market. Um, and your, your developers, and for those of you who are developers, um, obviously you understand this probably better than anybody. Software composition uh, analysis empowers companies to use open source effectively. And it's really about empowering and enabling your organization to be much more effective with their use of open source. Um, organizations must look to integrate software composition analysis earlier in the software development life cycle. Um, a number of people are really talking about that. That's really kind of the next phase. We used to be more of a post-process um, analysis tool. Now we're moving it left in the development cycle. And I, I really think my key point today is that a poorly executed uh, program can really decrease a lot of the reasons that uh, developers are using so much, so much open source today. And uh, finally, um, taking a solution approach to understanding your risk tolerance and implementing the right policies uh, you know, will help you in doing ongoing management of open source software. So with that, I just want to see if there's any questions. It's kind of late in the day. Okay, so the, the question is, I talked about 
you know, a long approval process? Can I talk about possible solutions to that? So, uh, yes. <laughs> so, the, one of the concepts, we've been talking to a, n a number of uh, large software companies, and um, one of the things that they're talking about today kind of in their lexicon is this concept of fidelity, okay, from a software composition analysis perspective. And it really ties into what I was talking about in, in terms of prioritizing, understanding and prioritizing risk. So the point is this, that rather than requiring every single developer to report every single piece of open source, right, you designate under what conditions, right, how the product is being built, how it's being distributed, who the market is, what kind of uh, exposure you know, do you have, what kind of attack vectors do you have from a security perspective, et cetera, and require that, that the approval process from a manual perspective only go for those things that are at the, at the, highest, at the highest level of fidelity, where you need the greatest, uh, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about a microscope as an analogy, Right, the things that you need to put under the microscope. So you start categorizing your, your product area and your application development. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that there are plenty of tools out there today. There are tools that, that we provide. Um, there's uh, business uh, process management tools, right, that can implement um, you know, process workflows within your organization. And those can be set up with business rules. And so a lot of what happens is your, your legal organization can start to set and say, um, for example, a certain class of licenses uh, creates virtually no risk for us. Okay, and those types of things, the developer goes in and says, okay, I want to use these sets of libraries, I want to use this framework, and based on the licensing information, they still have a, you know, a requirement to submit this into some type of a workflow process, and that, that actually could be automated. But when they submit it, then the, the, the business rules will automatically approve those components, right? And only in the cases where it's high fidelity do you really care and want to take a second look. So it's really about automating a request approval workflow. It, it, it's interesting. Um, our solution really started um, with a company called Palamita about 15 years ago, and it was really about open source scanning. It was about taking a code base, scanning it, and see if we could find any evidence of third-party components in it, right? Today, we engage many customers that we go in and we go, hey, we got a great scanning engine. They go, we don't care. We don't care about scanning. What we care about is request approval workflow and how do we, how do we kind of smooth that out? And so we're working with another, a number of companies where we've built pretty complex uh, systems to really kind of you know, uh, reduce friction, if you will. So. Just a couple ideas.